Humeral shaft fractures. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Christopher Sigalski, and I'm Sakit Brahman narrating. This is going to be our second video uh, in this slide deck. Uh, in the first one, we covered anatomy, deforming forces. Uh, we started to get into um, the surgical approaches for open reduction internal fixation, the applied anatomy. Uh, and uh, now we're going to talk a little bit more about intramedullary nailing and get into a few other techniques and also talk about just back, take a step back and talk about indications. So this is from uh, Rockwood and Green. Uh, again, if you go over to ota.org, you can uh, uh, get membership and have online trauma access, which gives you access to the textbook as well as lots of videos. So if you... Um, Look here, you'll see these are nails that have an interference fit, and there are other uh, designs out there in addition to these. Um, there are nails, modern nails, that have interlocking screws both proximally and distally, and there are many examples of this. Um, when you're going to be doing an intramedullary nail, uh, you'll want to use a radiolucent table. Uh, in this particular setup, you can see C-arm uh, uh, positioned on the opposite side of the patient. Um, so with the technique, you're going to do a proximal exposure, expose the rotator cuff, verify your position with the blunt radiolucent object, make a one centimeter incision to the rotator cuff as medial as possible uh, at the apex of the head. And depending on your nail design, the entry portal may vary. Uh, you open the cortex, oftentimes with a hand awl, um, reduce the fracture using fluoroscopic guidance, pass the guide wire across the fracture, ream the canal. Uh, of course, you always start the reamer inside the bone, and when you get to the fracture site, you usually want to kind of push the reamer across um, to try and hopefully prevent radial nerve injury. Um, and uh, when you're in the humeral head, you usually try to stop reaming and just pull it out by hand. Um, try to clean out all the debris, uh, make sure it's not getting into the subacromial space, for example. Um, Maintain fracture reduction uh, during nail insertion uh, so that you don't cause additional atrogenic fracture. Uh, most importantly, do not allow, or not most importantly, but importantly, do not allow fracture distraction. So when you're doing compression pleating, usually you can avoid this a little more easily, but when you're doing nailing, there's a tendency potentially to get a little bit of distraction, which does not work well uh, with humeral shaft fracture healing. So uh, be sure the nail is not prominent. You want to make sure that's really countersunk proximally, lock proximally, lock distally. Now, when you go to lock distally, typically you have to do an open approach. It's a freehand technique. Uh, and um, you know, usually you want to go down, get retractors in there uh, so you can clearly see where you are and avoid neurovascular injury. So, so um, pitfalls, right? So make sure your image intensifier views are adequate. And if not, you can get into trouble. So uh, take the time to position, check images before prepping. It may not be a, a position or sort of setup for your team that you're doing all the time. Um, for most people, this is not like, a, you know, multiple times a week, uh, everyday case. Um, consider the location of the assistance and the OR table to prevent contamination. So this is another thing if you're not careful. Um, another pitfall is leaving the nail unlocked distally. You, know, you should really try to get some type of fixation distally. Um, here's an example on the right-hand side where you have a new fracture at the tip of a fixed nail that was inserted. Um, you know, they put it a little bit tight just to avoid having to do locking screws distally. Um, and uh, you get a fracture. So be careful with your nail insertion. And then you got to lock distally. Just open up, do perfect circles, and lock distally. It can be slightly awkward uh, with the positioning and the setup, but um, it will uh, pay off for you. Um, and we talked about making sure you use an open incision for safe visualization distally when you do those screws. So if you go to ota.org, uh, and you get go to OTA online, um, you can uh, view this video. This is just a screenshot. I cannot play it inside the slide deck. But uh, you can go ahead and see that video online there. Um, so for retrograde nailing, so retrograde nailing can, is another technique 
uh, instead of answer grade nailing, you you go um, posteriorly. Uh, now again, the distal humerus, it's not like the distal femur, right? Or, or the proximal tibia. You're not going to put the nail at the very uh, sort of articular surface or end of the bone. You have to go in the supracondylar region. Remember that the, the diaphysis, you know, ends probably about there, right? So um, you're going to uh, open up sort of a cortical window. Um, you can use a burr, for example, uh, or make drill holes in a chisel. Um, reduce the fracture, pass the guide wire, hand ream uh, the distal canal, uh, and um, advance your nail in retrograde. Again, you're coming in from posterior, so it's not exactly a straight shot. Uh, ream to a larger uh, canal if nail passage is difficult, so you don't cause iatrogenic fracture going in with this. And uh, lock distally, and then lock proximally. Proximally is going to be a freehand technique. So there's an example. You have a split in your triceps, portal for your uh, nail entry in the supracondylar uh, region. Um, nails, uh, guide wires pass, nails pass across a fracture site. Uh, and then there's your your final x-rays. So pitfalls and prevention. So um, again, positioning, make sure nothing's in your way, check images ahead of time, uh, make sure everybody knows where they're going to be and you're draped properly to avoid contamination. Um, make sure you lock proximally, right? So the canal is conical in shape and wide as proximally, so you really got to lock proximally when you're doing retrograde nailing. Um, don't underestimate the risk of iatrogenic supracondylar fracture. So your portal really has to be uh, generous. You have to make sure you have a nice entry hole and you're not coming in at a steep angle. Minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis. So a um, few ways to do this. This is from, again, uh, Rockwood and Green at uh, otaonline.org. And... Um, here you can see uh, multiple incisions and uh, sort of anterior approaching for a minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis with proximal and distal windows, and then using a tunneling instrument uh, to perform this. Here's an example of a 21-year-old woman who had a fall, humeral shaft fracture, um, treated with uh, minim minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis. And um, here you can see uh, post-operative x-rays um, and um, fracture healing with callus formation four months after surgery with a satisfactory result. And that's reference from the journal Orthopedic Trauma and the reference shown there. So some of the steps expose those windows, identify and protect the neurovascular structures that are nearby, uh, reduce the fracture with longitudinal traction uh, or distractors if necessary. You have to create a, an extra periosteal tunnel and then a tunneling instrument. And here's where you have to be cautious to avoid iatrogenic neurovascular injury. And generally you use a 4.5 millimeter type uh, narrow uh, dynamic compression plate and you secure that on either side while the fracture is reduced and then insert the other screws uh, and just careful not to put screws. This is usually a bridge plating technique. So you usually don't put screws in the area of comminution. You're not gonna get uh, uh, anatomic reduction and compression with this. So pitfalls, um, you know, it, it's an indirect reduction technique. Um, so, uh, you know, you are a little bit more likely to end up with an unacceptable fracture reduction. Um, so the technique can be a little bit more challenging here. Unstable fixation. So if you're not careful, um, you may not have enough fixation for fractures that essentially you're bridging. So you generally need longer plates. Uh, and of course, we talked so much about you know making sure you know where the radial nerve in, is and with all your approaches and how it can be injured and um, so of course if you can't see it um, there's potential risk here for radial nerve injury so you have to know where it is um, especially if you're doing any kind of lateral and posterior approach and usually it's um, something you're going to do um, like I showed anteriorly. Um, and uh, if you have, if you do ORF in the presence of radial nerve palsy, then it can be challenging to understand uh, whether or not you've 
incorporated any additional injury. Um, so if you go to otaonline.org, uh, you can see this technique video. It will not play in the slide deck for me. Uh, it's a nice uh, video if you want to check that out. Okay, indications. A little bit about indications. So um, there are many fractures that can be treated non-surgically. So you can say a strong indication for non-operative management are isolated acute closed fractures in a cooperative ambulatory patient. Uh, relative indication would be uh, most type A fractures in the AO OTA classification. If you go back to the first video, uh, proximal third long oblique fractures, segmental fractures. Um, you can also treat low velocity gunshot fractures with small wounds that don't have neurovascular injury with non operative management. Um, and sometimes you may say, like a non compliant patient may be better for non operative management. I mean, it can kind of cut either way. Relative contraindications are patients with multiple injuries, right? So polytrauma, you're more likely to consider operative fixation. Additional injuries to the ipsilateral arm, floating elbows, brachial plexus injury, bilateral humerus fractures or paraprosthetic fractures. And, um, you know, real contraindications are significant vascular injury, pathological fractures, non-unions. So if you're going to treat non-surgically, um, you can use a Velpo bandage, uh, just kind of a U-slab or um, coaptation splint, we call it. Uh, hanging cast is also an option you don't see as much anymore. Uh, uses gravity reduction. And the functional brace, which is um, generally the preferred method for uh, non-surgical management that allows you to sort of avoid the issues with so-called fracture disease with muscle atrophy and joint stiffness and um, maintain and uh, regain function uh, while still uh, um, avoiding the risks of surgery. Uh, if you go to otaonline.org, you'll be able to check out this uh, video here on uh, coaptation splinting uh, for humeral shaft fractures. What about operative management? Well, uh, indications are inability to maintain a satisfactory reduction with uh, what you consider uh, appropriate alignment, multiple injuries, bilateral fractures, floating elbows. A lot of stuff we talked about are contraindications for non-surgical management, right? Progressive radial nerve palsy, um, warranting exploration, significant vascular injury, non-union um, pathologic fractures. And then relative indications are... Um, uh, open fractures. So if you have an open fracture, usually you can treat these surgically in most cases. Segmental fractures, long oblique fractures um, with valgus angulation, uh, wounds that are going to require care, even if it's not an open fracture. Let's say you have burns. Uh, non compliant patients. So again, these can kind of go either way. Um, sometimes you, know, you may need to consider fixing them or not fixing them. Um, doesn't really help you out either way. Um, Periprosthetic fractures, obesity, can be challenging to treat non-surgically uh, due to the body habitus. So some general pitfalls in prevention. So when you're doing ORIF, we showed a lot of uh, cases already, try to avoid excessive stripping, be familiar with the anatomy, understand your approaches, understand where the radial nerve is, etc. Careful dissection uh, and just attention to detail. Unacceptable reduction of the fracture. So, you know, this is, you can avoid this with adequate surgical exposure using C arm imaging. Uh, you can accept a little bit of shortening, but not too much more than two to three centimeters. And if that allows you to get compression, then you can sometimes do that uh, with a small amount of shortening. Uh, if you really have larger gaps, you may have to come back and do bone grafting. Um, unstable fixation is a problem. So, uh, using small plates with inadequate fixation. Um, so most humeral shaft fractures, um, certainly mid diaphyseal fractures, 4.5 millimeter fixation is kind of the traditional uh, size of fixation to use, although um, you can sometimes use uh, 4.5 plates uh, or thickness plates with um, smaller screws if the plates are designed for that. Um, if you have distal fractures, sometimes you have to use a second plate. 
right? Or incorporate, inc incorporate all the way down to the uh, very distal segment of the humerus. And iatrogenic neurovascular injury. So this is, you know, in the humerus, you really got to be familiar with the radial nerve. You just no way around it. Um, and um, make sure careful dissection, protect the nervi vessels and nerves, avoid excessive traction, don't be placing surclage wires and cables where you can't see where they're going, and uh, being careful not to iatrogenically injure things with your tools. So we're going to pause here and we'll pick up with uh, functional bracing of humeral shaft fractures in the next video.